It's a cultural opportunity for students and the community to explore the rich heritage of St. Bernard. As Nunez Community College and Penn TV present the Nunez History Lecture Series. Hi, I'm Carol Devine. Welcome to this edition of the Nunez College History Lecture Series. Today, our focus is the women of St. Bernard. I feel really privileged to shine the spotlight on some of the women in St. Bernard Parish. We aren't by any means attempting to give you a comprehensive picture here or a chronology. What we've done might be compared to taking a still camera and panning around and taking snapshots here and there. Working with the Times Picayune as I do, I've discovered that everyone has a story. So when I started helping to put together this project of examining the history or herstory of women in St. Bernard, I should have known that it would be huge. And I've realized that this parish has been blessed with an extraordinary number of women, people who are extraordinary in their strength of character, talent, generosity, courage, resourcefulness, and their pioneering spirit. I'm talking about women in every walk of life, women as wives, mothers, elected officials, volunteers, businesswomen, educators. Abraham Lincoln said, men are what their mothers made them. History doesn't often give accounts of people who are behind the scenes, like the countless women who are behind the great men and women who do so much behind the scenes unheralded work. So we can't really report much on those individuals here, but each one of us knows some of them. At any rate, it wasn't until a few decades ago that women have played more visible roles in the community. Some women have been finally recognized after many years of unselfish service. Thelma Dino was one such person. Incredibly, Ms. Dino was a volunteer for the Red Cross of St. Bernard for 62 years. That type of consistency of purpose is almost unheard of in today's disposable society. She served on virtually every level of the Red Cross, doing whatever job needed to be done. She was eventually chairperson. It was largely because of her tireless efforts that more than 30,000 people, victims of Hurricane Betsy, were provided food and shelter. Now, while she was working through this disaster, someone told Ms. Dino that 14 members of her own family who were being evacuated from Araby had been in a boat that capsized. Well, she was visibly shaken, but she went on providing the service for the people of St. Bernard who needed her. The family members turned out to be okay, by the way. Ms. Dino was also a longtime employee of the school system, working 41 years. She was eligible for retirement after 40 years, but she stayed another year because she was needed, and she did it almost for free. This lady was also the driving force behind the St. Bernard Battered Women's Shelter that bears her name today. Thelma Dino served as the first president of the Business and Professional Women's Club. Her footprints are all over the parish. But we see other women's footprints, too. For example, other women of the Red Cross, like Lucia Lorio. We see nurses, healers, and midwives, like Celie Robin and her mother. Business women, like Leonia Nunez, who operated a restaurant for 40 years and was the postmaster in Violet and the mother of Senator Sammy Nunez. Like the first woman police juror, Blanche Molero, the first councilwoman, Nita Hutter, and the First Lady of St. Bernard, longtime clerk of court and community service person, Lena Torres. The first woman on the school board and its first president, Anita Miro. And women who taught us how to dance, like Audrey Odenet Schenk and Glenda Hosell. Did you know that some women even helped us win the Battle of New Orleans? As the story goes, the mother superior of the Ursulines convent in the French Quarter at the time was Saint Marie de Vezin. Now, she was a Chalmette girl whose parents owned a plantation here. She had the nuns pray for an American victory during an all-night vigil just before the battle. Of course, the Americans did win, or we all might be speaking English. When the nuns found out about the victory, though, they promised to celebrate an annual mass in honor of Our Lady of Prompt Succor. This is why some years later, in 1951, the church parish in Chalmette would be called Our Lady of Prompt Succor. There's a special breed of women who touched all of our lives, our educators. The names of some stand out especially. Maud Bergeron was one. She started her teaching career at the 
old Sebastian Roy School in Wyclosky in the mid-30s. At the time, the small school with eight grades, eight classes near the bayou had trouble getting teachers. It was a long distance to drive, 30 miles from Araby. So the teachers who worked there also lived above the school. Maud taught first grade. Many of the children were sons and daughters of trappers and fishermen. Some came to school in pirogs. 90% of them were on some kind of free lunch program. Now Maud had had polio when she was four years old and she was partially crippled. So it wasn't easy for her to haul her water upstairs, which was what they all had to do. There was actually a large outhouse with eight seats on one side for the boys and eight seats on the other side for the girls. When Jim Lewis, who would later become Maud's husband, started teaching there in 1954, he was the only male teacher at the time. Something about the boys' behavior in the outhouse was bothering Maud, so she asked Jim, the only, teacher, the, the only male teacher there, to go find out why they were spending so much time in the outhouse. What Jim found out was that the water acted like a mirror, so that when the boys would look, they could see the girls on the other side. It was Maud who instigated having the outhouse shut down eventually and getting indoor plumbing. According to Jim, Maud got the urge to get ahead, so she enrolled at Tulane University and would travel back and forth from Wyclosky to Uptown New Orleans until she earned her master's degree plus 30 hours. She became principal of Sebastian Roy, then in a few years left and became principal of Lacoste School. Jim said she was a top educator. Another remarkable woman was Claire Landry. Claire also taught at Sebastian Roy, but for a year. She and Maud actually became longtime friends. Things were a little different when Claire joined the faculty in 1950. The teachers no longer lived above the school, but six of them would carpool down from Araby. One time it was raining and the road was very slick. They were in Kenilworth when the car went out of control and turned over. Fortunately, nobody was seriously injured. School there and then was very much like family, Claire told me, and things they did then couldn't be done today. For example, most of the kids at the school were Catholic, so every Friday they would go to Mass at a church about a half a block away. Then they'd come back and have hot biscuits. And Claire said, I don't think I came home one day without bringing shrimp or fish that the families would give to me. Claire taught in Covington for a couple of years, then at Araby Elementary. She got her master's degree and became the first principal of the brand new St. Claude Heights School. At age 25, she had five years experience and was the youngest principal in the state. She was there for three years, then got married and moved with her husband to New Jersey. Well, after four and a half years, she came back. We St. Bernardians always seem to come back. Claire taught again at Araby Elementary, then became a guidance counselor at Andrew Jackson. Eventually, she was assistant principal and then principal. Claire wasn't stopping. She was elected to the Board of Elementary and Secondary Education and became its president for three years. She was one of the first few to get accepted into the doctoral program at UNO when it was first offered there. Two of the other few happened to be Dr. Elizabeth Zimmerman, who would be the first female school superintendent, and Dr. Tommy Warner, who would eventually be Chancellor of Nunez. But we're not finished with Claire yet. She's amazing. She decided to go to law school at night. She said she'd always wanted to be an attorney, but when she first graduated in the 40s, women weren't allowed in the law or the pre-law programs. She did become an attorney, but finally decided that she hated it. She retired a second time, but then became a part-time counselor at Hannon High School, where she is today. Claire is 72 years old. Did I mention that during her career, she took off four years and had two sons? We all have fond memories of certain teachers, people who've made strong impressions on us and even changed our lives. I have a brief story to tell you about one of mine, Mrs. Travis B. Long. She was not very tall, but she was dynamite. She taught English and public speaking. As a freshman, I had my very first speech class with her, and she gave me the courage and inspiration to overcome great shyness and do what I do today, 
But my favorite story about her is one from English class when she was trying to teach us the meaning of the word supine. She rushed up to the blackboard as she would do when she was inspired and she picked up the chalk and proceeded to draw on the blackboard a giant cockroach lying supinely on its back with its legs sticking up in the air. I'm sure if I could round up all my classmates from that class that all know the meaning of the word supine. Now, I'd like to introduce you to a special guest who's actually another teacher. She's a history professor at Tulane University. She is the author of Intimate Enemies, The Two Worlds of the Baroness of Pontalba. She also once taught at St. Bernard Community College. She's a wealth of information. Please welcome Dr. Christina Vela. Thank you, Carol. I've been asked to talk tonight about women of St. Bernard Parish or a woman of St. Bernard. And one of the first ones who pops into my mind is um, Victoire de Lino de Chalmet or Chalmet. She was the wife of the man, or you might say the co-owner, of the Chalmet plantation where the Battle of New Orleans was fought. And it's very hard to think about that battle without thinking about the people in the background who were so important to the success of Andrew Jackson. But before we get into the battle, let's try to remember what the battle was all about. First of all, this was the War of 1812. The year was 1814, and as a matter of fact, the war had, a truce had already been declared three weeks before. But travel being very slow, people didn't realize that there was no need for this battle. It was a totally useless battle. Another thing that's very interesting about it is that about 3,000 British were lost, only about 13 Americans. The battle itself really went on for about two weeks. This wasn't just, you know, a one morning thing. The whole invasion, the whole operation took about two weeks. It was really one of the most underrated and interesting things in military history, how this came about. But I'm not going to go into that so much. I want to go into it from the standpoint of this woman who was there watching something amazing taking place in her front yard. We have to just try to imagine what it must have been like, those of us who've never seen a battle, who've never been around war, to see something like this going on a few feet from you and, and right almost in your house. Uh, Victoire de Lino de Chalmay was probably in her 60s or 70s when this took place. She was no spring chicken. And the War of 1812 had been going on for a long time. They were expecting an invasion somewhere on the Gulf Coast. Now, as you know, that war was really about the British trying to take back uh, the American colonies. And one of the important ways they intended to take it back was to take the Mississippi River. The battle was really for the Mississippi River. How would they come in to reach that river? Would they come in through the mouth of the river? Well, there were several various ways. They could have come in through Barataria, but I know it, that we all associate the name Barataria with pirates. The privateer, Jean Lafitte, was um, defending that area. That wasn't a wise place to come in. They could have come in um, in, let's say, Mobile and then marched overland. They could have come in in Baton Rouge and marched overland to the Mississippi River. And in fact, those two entrances were exactly what was expected. Poor Victoire de Lino de Chalmay, she had three children. One of them was childless. She was the cousin and closest friend of the Baroness Pontalba, which was how I got to know this family. She uh, had another daughter. I forget what that daughter's, how, her, what her progeny was, but she had an, another daughter who had 15 children. And all of them were gathered around uh, when this battle took place. She, Victoire, had to deal, of course, with the militia, the Frenchmen, and uh, others. She herself was a French Creole, a Creole meaning anyone who was born in the New World whose parents or ancestors had been born overseas. As you know, there were French Creoles, Spanish Creoles, African Creoles, Black Creoles, everything. It did not mean a person of mixed blood. So she 
in the weeks leading up to the battle, she had all of these militia people coming in and out of her plantation discussing things. It was very soon made Andrew Jackson's headquarters. Andrew Jackson arrived for the battle, and so did uh, Pakenham, the British commander. Of course, he didn't uh, occupy the plantation, but he was there too. And what did she have to put up with when the combatants arrived? Well, first of all, a lot of the Americans were frontiersmen who were good shots. They weren't necessarily soldiers who were accustomed to discipline or taking orders from anybody. But everybody was absolutely needed because Andrew Jackson put out a call for the militia. He wanted 800. He got something like 200. He would scour the bar rooms and try to get everybody he could out of New Orleans to come out there and help fight off this invasion of the British. The French at this time were not so sure that they wanted to fight the British. They didn't, weren't crazy about the Americans. They still were French in their hearts, many of them, even though heaven knows they had lived under Spanish rule for 40 years and they were as much accustomed to Spanish administration as anything. But Andrew Jackson arrives and he starts, the first thing he needs is men and weapons. And so he uh, requisitions all the re weapons in New Orleans. He doesn't get enough. He'd send out another requisition order and searches, and they basically would require people to bring all their rusty antique arms, anything that they had in with which they could fight. All I can say about that battle is thank goodness for Jean Lafitte and the Baratarians and their artillery, because it was to a great extent artillery that won the Battle of New Orleans, so without Jean Lafitte, it wasn't a negligible quantity. So he gets uh, the militia, the people who were accustomed to parading around Jackson Square, which at that time was called the Place d'Armes. It would later be called Jackson Square after, of course, Andrew Jackson, after he had won this battle. But he gets, you know, these aristocrats who love to dress up and parade around but certainly don't want to fight. He gets some Choctaw Indians. Um, the Choctaws were a peaceable bunch. All the Indians in this area were pretty much peaceable, except for certain rare occurrences, certain incidences that you know one could point to. But still, the plantation people, because they saw so little of the Indians, were terrified of them. And th this whole band of Choctaws, you know, doing little war dances and all that, drove them crazy. It scared them to death. The free black militia came. God, free blacks! The last thing in the world we want is to arm free blacks. We've been trying to keep those people unarmed and humble all this time. My God, they think they're white. We can't have free black militias. But nevertheless, the free blacks came. Andrew Jackson welcomed them. It's an interesting thing going back to the Choctaw militia. Andrew Jackson was a killer of Indians. He loathed Indians. There was nothing that could make Andrew Jackson go into one of his temper tantrums like a discussion of the Indian menace. He had been an Indian fighter. This was his first appointment with a militia that really wasn't out to fight Indians, Seminoles or somebody. And someone asked uh, one of Andrew Jackson's subalterns, why does Andrew Jackson kill so many Indians? Because after they'd surrender, sometimes he'd just massacre them. And uh, the lieutenant or whatever he was said, I reckon because he knows how. They had absolutely no love for the Indians, but nevertheless, they were welcomed into this hodgepodge of a militia. So the people on the plantations, although the men were camped out in the marsh, in the swamp, and although they had their own supply station, the poor British were 80 miles from their supply station and they were wallowing around in the, the muck and mess. Still, there were many requests, many needs that these people addressed to the owners of the plantation. The Americans who came in, these uh, cane talks, these people who came down the river from Kentucky or wherever to help fight, and uh, people who came in from the countryside, a lot of them brought their wives and children with them. And the wives and children found that they couldn't camp out in the swamp with the men, and so they bunked in at the plantation until they could get rid of them, persuade them to go back home. That wasn't always easy. Victoire de Lino de Chalme had been accustomed to the importance of water. Remember that this is a battle for the Mississippi River. Remember, if you never remember anything else about American history, or European history for that matter, 
remember that for most of the 19th century and certainly the 18th and the 17th and the 16th century, the major thoroughfares in the world were water, not roads, not horses, certainly not railroads yet, but water. And it was only after railroads and then finally roads were going to replace water that this isn't true. All the houses along the river faced the river. All the houses along any waterway did because where they got supplies, supplies came in by water. If you wanted to go to the Gulf Coast, which people did, it was a resort area at that time, as it still is, of course, they didn't get on a horse and travel 100 miles to Biloxi. They got on a boat and they were served breakfast and there would be little games and things they could play until they got off the boat to the resorts on the Gulf Coast. If they wanted to go to Baton Rouge, they wouldn't dream of trying to get over the ruts that passed for roads or to get lost in the wilderness on the way to Baton Rouge. They got on a boat and went up the river. So they did understand that. They had been happy enough with the Americans owning the river after the Louisiana Purchase in 1803. Because these people who had, in the colonial days, which is basically from um, 1721 until 1803, in the colonial period, they had been so dependent for, uh, on imports that the mother country would allow them to have. Of course, they smuggled. They um, traded with Americans, British, anybody whom they weren't supposed to trade with. Because as you know, a mother country's idea of colonialism is that they would regulate trade with foreign countries. They would use the colony to supply the mother country with raw materials, and they would sell manufactured products back to the colony. Um, the only problem was that most mother countries, France, Spain, even England with its colonies, couldn't supply these colonies with the shoes and the violins and the glasses and the uh, playing cards and the clothes and the buttons and all the other things that the colonists, as they became more and more civilized as the economies developed, began to need. Guns, bullets, arms, all that kind of stuff. They began smuggling. They began trading with the Americans. So when the Americans finally took over Louisiana and had control of the river and could ship all kinds of products freely down the river to trade with these people at the end of the river, they were very happy. Imagine during the colonial period, one of the letters of Victoire Bellino de Chalmette to the Baroness Pontalba talks about how during the colonial period she had ordered clothes from, um, I guess you must have, this must have been from Spain, which must have bought them from England because Spain wasn't producing enough clothes at that time for even for its home population. And the way they ordered clothes in those days was that they ordered the pieces. A dress would be ordered like this, and then there would be lines where you would sew the pieces on the dress, and this would be large, this would be medium, this would be small. And so you would just sew the pieces together according to which size you wanted. Well, you can imagine how ill-fitting many of the clothes must have been. Shoes, they had a terrible time getting shoes. It was very commonplace that you as an individual would put in an order with your local merchant who was going to get the shipment in. You would order for your slaves, for yourself, for your family, let's say, 20 pairs of shoes in a size 8. And what you might get back were 80 pairs of shoes in a size 4. And what do you do with them? I mean, what in the world do you do? You paid for them. What do you do with those shoes? Well, of course, you send them back. It takes a year. Meanwhile, the slaves and everybody else are going around with their feet falling apart. There are no shoes. So they were very glad to be part of America. But whether they were part of America or part of England, to these French people, of course, they England was the enemy. It was the enemy of France. It, that's what they had fought the Napoleonic Wars over, which were still going on. It was the enemy of Spain. But they were not convinced that it was the enemy of the French Creoles in Louisiana. They were, more than anything else, very, very scared. Imagine Victoire's consternation when her husband went to visit Andrew Jackson and said, um, General Jackson, we know you have a lot on your mind, and, and we're just 
worried about this. We just got news that um, when the Russians retreated from Napoleon, um, and of course, you know, this happened hard upon the Battle of New Orleans, when Napoleon retreated, when the Russians retreated from Napoleon, they burned Moscow, they burned everything. It was just a scorched earth policy. What are we going to do if you have to retreat? Are you going to burn all of our crops, all of our plantations, everything? And Andrew Jackson, who was very busy, said, huh? I guess so. Well, he really didn't have, he didn't retreat, as you know. He didn't have to burn everything, because by the time the battle was over, the sugar crop had been brought in. Most of the crops, in fact, had been harvested ready or not, because they imagined that they were going to, it was going to be like a swarm of locusts over the fields. And everything had been stored in the warehouses. But of course, all the warehouses had been pillaged and everything had been absolutely destroyed. Um, one terrible story is about how the Americans, um, when they were ransacking the warehouses for materials, they took cotton bales and used them as uh, uh, barriers. You know, this was a kind of trench warfare. They basically dug in trenches in the marsh. And every time the British would lob um, fire into them, of course, it would put up so much smoke that then it, there was a terrific smoke screen and everybody would choke. That was bad enough. But when the Americans shot onto the British side, the British had denuded the storehouses of sugar, bales of sugar. And as soon as anything would hit, the sugar would start running out all over the place. Well, as you know, the poor British seamen, the Navy, the British Navy was always starving its sailors and not providing them with very much, uh, and they were very cruel. These sailors were starving, so they'd take the sugar and eat it by the handfuls. It was full of all sorts of things, impurities. It was full of uh, cane stalks and glass and everything else, so they all had terrific diarrhea and vomiting there in the marsh. When they died, as they did by the thousands, as you know, um, they had never buried their dead in a marsh before, so these British all popped up, came floating to the surface again. Then the sun, sun would come out, the dogs would eat the bodies. It was really a mess around these plantations. Three weeks after the Battle of New Orleans, of course, the plantation had been uh, blown up by the Americans so that it couldn't provide cover for the British. And three weeks later, Ignace Delino de Chalmette died uh, of a stroke and probably a broken heart, too. His wife, who had put up with Choctaws, Free Blacks, Cane Talks, and Andrew Jackson himself, who was, believe me, a handful, a handful, and Andrew Jackson's wife, who thought that New Orleans was probably the most sinful place her bigoted little mind had ever seen, and she was scared to death of the Creoles because they were going to introduce her husband to sin. Heaven knows what sin you could introduce Andrew Jackson to, uh, except possibly being rude to ladies because he was always invariably courtly and gentlemanly to ladies and, and correct. But anyway, poor uh, Victoire de Lino de Chalmay, after that, she got rid of everything on the plantation. They were deeply in debt, of course, because they had lost the crop. They had lost the plantation. They were, like everybody else, mortgaged for the next year's crop. She uh, sold everything. She went to live in an apartment in New Orleans, and she lived to be a very ripe 90 years old. She was semi-literate. She wrote a lot of letters to the Baroness who thought that she was like her mother. Um, she apparently lived with a servant whom she had had during all of her years of owning slaves. Her own maid servant was a free black woman who stayed with her up to the end, and she lived with her daughter, the single daughter, Azalee Chalmay, who was um, a spinster. When I think back on what that battle must have meant to her, it was a very different battle. But nevertheless, her battle as well as the battle that was fought by the soldiers and sailors and frontiersmen on her plantation, what an interesting and indomitable woman she must have been, like so many St. Bernard women. You have been a wonderful audience. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Christina. Now, another special guest is a lovely lady who is, in fact, 
first lady of Sebastopol Plantation. That home on Bayou Road is on the National Registry of Historic Homes, and it's now in preparation to have some tour groups come through. Alberta Graf Lewis has been doing some research into her home and into other plantations, and she's uncovered some interesting stories of women I thought you'd like to hear. Please welcome Mrs. Alberta Lewis. My stories about women on the plantations begins with uh, a more current um, time, and although it doesn't involve a woman on a plantation, it also involves the Burgod Plantation, which Christine had just spoken of so fluently. In 1961, the Business Professional Women's Group was formed, and by 1964, Louise Gorbaty had become president. Louise was a, a strong woman of great vision and of action, and it was her hope that there could be a bell that would ring on the 4th of July that would become a tradition in the community. And so a handbell was purchased, and then later uh, a, another plantation bell was, was installed at Borgard Plantation, and that's how that involved the plantation. It stayed there for some, some years, and it was rung every 4th of July, and it was quite a picnic for business and professional women. Today, we now ring that bell at the, bell at the government complex, and the bell that is rung is a replica, and not a replica, actually. It was made in the same mold as the Liberty Bell. And so the story began with a vision, went on to a plantation, and now has become an important part of the communi community, just as St. Bernard plantations have always been. It wasn't possible, they thought, to the, the BPW group to raise the 2,000 for small replicas in, <clears throat> when in 70, in, prior to eight, uh, 1976, uh, the same foundry that had poured the Liberty Bell announced that they would make bells available in the United States for the 1976 celebration. $1,000 or $2,000 was the cost of the very small bells. As, the, as Louise began her action, it became obvious that they would be able to afford the $15,000 replica exact size of the Liberty Bell. A lot went into that. A great many um, funds were raised, and the entire community was involved, and it was because of the vision of this one woman that we today, and the, and the, the work of the BPW, but today we now have the Liberty Bell standing and rung on every 4th of July as a wonderful community tradition. My next group of stories involves Sebastopol Plantation, of which I have been learning a great deal about in, the historic, in earlier times. I'll begin with Rosa Nunez Ducro, who owned, purchased the plantation in the 1880s. She was a very strong, independent woman, and she purchased the plantation with her own parafernal funds, even though she was married. So when it became obvious that she, her husband was quite a womanizer and she began having misgivings about the situation she was in and it couldn't, it, he didn't seem to want to correct it. Finally, she ran the rascal off and she actually ran Sebastopol Plantation, which was quite an extensive holding, all by herself. And the story goes that she actually had a shotgun that she kept in her office, which is the same office that my husband still uses today, where she had to pay off the workers because it was still a working plantation. So she did a great job running a plantation as a woman on her own. The same plantation spawned three great women prior to that in the 1860s. I'll tell you the story of M Martha I'm sorry, yeah, Martha Goodwin Bassett Van Bibber. She was born in Boston in 1805, and she was received a classical education, entering Harvard at age 19, I'm sorry, 14, in the year of 1819. So she was educated as a, as a, a teacher. She graduated from, or finished Harvard in 1824. This was quite an accomplishment for women of those days. She went on to teach in charity a charity school that was the site of Bunker Hill. Later she married and became involved with an inst 
literary institution in Texas through her first husband, who was the good, the Bassett part of her name. He passed away, and then she married a wealthy plantation owner from South Carolina, who was of Holland descent. And in 1859, the two moved to Sebastopol, along with her daughter by her first husband, who was Ann Bassett. Now, during this time of the 1860s, it was the time of the Civil War. Anne was just, the daughter was just a young woman, and um, she became very involved, and her obituary glows with the work that she did serving the community during the time of the Civil, the Civil War, taking care of the, the soldiers, seeing to that they, that they had provisions, and, and attending to life as it was to go on at Sebastopol Plantation. Mind you now, Sebastopol Plantation was originally founded and developed as a producing and operating sugar mill, a sugar plantation with a mill of its own. So she had quite, um, quite an area to run. Of course, she had her husband with it. She wasn't like Rosa, who followed her in years later. In 1858 and 59, the production of sugar from, those planta from the plantation was listed as 70 up to 150 hogsheads of sugar, which were quite large. So these were important years during the, the 1860s. And this was when her granddaughter, the daughter of Ann Bassett, was born, and that was Maddie. So Ma we have a photograph now of Maddie, who is the child who was born in Sebastop on Sebastopol in 1861. For some reason, which we haven't been able to determine, in 1865, the fall of 1860, the winter of 1865, they were removed from the plantation, possibly something to do with the Civil War, because we have the diary of Mr. Van Bibber, who n annotates all the events of the Civil War, the surrender, uh, the soldiers coming through, uh, the possibility of a Confederate soldier being buried there. But in 1866, on January 1, they were moved from Sebastopol, and they moved into New Orleans. Her granddaughter at the time was, uh, let's see, her granddaughter was born in 1861, and this was 64, was a young child. So during the granddaughter's formative years, she lived in New Orleans. The father of the, grand of the daughter was a steamboat captain when he was on um, Sebastopol lands. He was also sheriff of St. Bernard. So these three, these women shared a great responsibility. One of the th responsibilities that they shared was that of taking care of the, the sick and being responsible for the people who lived there, the workers, the family, the extended families. So as we move further down the parish from Beauregard to Sebastopol and further on down, there were no plantations, but there were fishing villages. And in the fishing villages, we celebrate the, the midwives and the practitioners who probably came to the plantation to help the lady of the plantation to serve the, uh, and take care of the people that were under her care. We see a lot of that in, with Celie Robin at the uh, Isleños Museum and her story of her heritage. Now moving on back with the Van Bibber Bassett family, Martha then, uh, uh, Martha and her, her daughter and granddaughter and the captain, who now has boats that ply the, the waters of the Bayou Terrebouf and the Mississippi and goes down much further to landings, what they call landing south, and what went all the way up the Mississippi to uh, landings up in Jefferson, Indiana. At the time, he had a vessel that cost $60,000 in those years to build. And his family, the women of his family, uh, participated in all of this. So when the mother of Anne, of, of Maddie, this is the middle generation, passed away, Martha and Maddie then migrated up to Kansas City and we find in our history of Sebastopol an entry of an interview when she was 95 years old. This was, this was uh, 1905. She was, I'm sorry, it was a 1900 pu publication. 
and this was when she was 19, uh, 95 years old. And she still remembered her special time on the lands at Sebastopol. And I will read that to you in a moment, but before that I want to give you one more story about a special woman who lived at Kenilworth. Kenilworth Plantation um, tells the story of a young woman who was the only child, the only daughter of a family of many boys and very treasured as a person. And she had appendicitis and was operated on at Sebastopol Plantation. Unfortunately, she passed away during the operation or just following the operation. And Kenilworth's story of women today, it, has, it too has been a, a, a plantation of strong women histories. But the one remembrance of Kenilworth is this young maiden in white who floats the halls and stairways of Kenilworth as the ghost of the young woman who was uh, ill and then passed away during the operation at Kenilworth. <clears throat> to go back to my stories of Sebastopol, moving up to the story of the in the newspaper, I would like to read to you two things. Uh, one is the writings of um, of Martha, and the other is just a story of the remembrances she still had at 95. Although they had slaves on the plantation and she was in sympathy with the South, she cared for her, uh, her uh, land workers so carefully and so lovingly that as she migrated to Kansas City, in her story at, ni at 95, she still remembers that the many of the slaves former slaves still came to visit the old mistress in Kansas City during the times that she lived there. And incidentally, the strength of the, gen gen of the female's generation show in the fact that the uh, grandmother still, at the time of the interview, lived with the daughter, with the granddaughter and her husband. So you have a clear following of three generations of very strong, uh, educated women. Uh, women of great dexterity and accomplishments. Spastopol, I'm sorry, St. Bernard has many plantations which we have lost. We have a few which we have retained. And I think Martha's words in her diary in, in, 18, in 1866 when they were removed from the plantation because of the political events following the Civil War. She writes, I feel sad in view of our removal from this place. I have had many, many, very many hours of friendship since I have lived here. My, I, I muse often to the days past here in sweet fellowship with my wonderful fa family, my dear loved husband and companion, and all those who lived here with us. I think that kind of captures what we know of plantation life. It was a hard life. It was a working life. It, was, it required much dedication. And all the, although the men owned the plantations in most cases, and although they saw to it for most of the laborious work, we mustn't forget that it was the women who carried the day-to-day -day events of the plantation, caring for the well-being of all those who lived on there. And they did it so well that we capture now this feeling of peace and serenity on the few plantations that are still left here. We thank, I thank you for this opportunity to share with you my experience and my learning of what's happened at some of these plantations. Thank you. Thank you, Alberta. Someone wrote a play about an imagined meeting between two of the world's greatest stage actresses of the early 1900s, Sarah Bernhardt and Eleonora Duza. In the last scene, they're talking about wanting to be remembered. Eleonora says, it's too much work, this immortality. But Sarah reminds her that it's all we've got, so it will have to do. As human creatures, we all want immortality. The way we find it, the way we live on, is through what we leave behind us, the work we do, the ways we serve others, and the 
the stories people will tell about us. Isn't that all history is, though? I'm personally grateful for the women of the stories we've heard today and also about those we haven't heard yet. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you next time.